All right, I have one o'clock um, and my time. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar today on the new project evaluation of trunk and arm support exoskeletons for construction. I'm Jessica Bunting, the CPWR host for this event. I'm just here to make sure things go smoothly and to provide technical support. Um, so if you're having any trouble during the webinar, um, you can send me a message in the chat box or if you are having trouble connecting to the um, online portion uh, through WebEx, you can just email me by responding to the WebEx registration or the reminder email that just went out 15 minutes ago. If you are logged in but experiencing difficulties hearing the sound through your computer speakers, I recommend calling in using your phone instead. Sometimes that audio can be clearer. Um, and that information can be found in any of the event emails. I also um, put it in, down in the Q&A section um, so you can see it there as well. Uh, just be sure if you do that to disconnect the audio from your computer or turn off your speakers to avoid an echo. We'll take some time at the end of today's presentation to answer questions and you can enter those at any time in the Q&A or chat box during the presentation and I'll do my best to get through all of them with our presenters at the end. Um, and today's webinar is being recorded. I will share that along with a PDF of the slides by the end of this week. Our presenters today lead the research team for this exoskeletons project, conducting a mixed methods assessment of exo to understand the perspectives of a broad set of industry stakeholders, to quantify the benefits and risks of exo use, to facilitate adoption, and to prevent unexpected consequences. Carissa Harris Adamson is an assistant professor at UC San Francisco in Berkeley, as well as the director of the UC Ergonomics Research Program. And Maureen Nussbaum is a professor at Virginia Tech and the director of the Occupational Biomechanics and Ergonomics Program. And I'll hand it over to Maureen now to get us started. Okay, thanks, Jess. Hello, everyone, all 142 of you. I'm not sure where in the world you are, so I'll say good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on where you are. So. In the limited time we have, I'm just going to jump in. And before I do, very briefly, neither of our research teams has any conflicts of interest. And we had four main goals in putting together this presentation. First, very briefly, is to talk about the problem of musculoskeletal disorders in the construction industry, introduce you to passive exoskeletons and the potential they have to assist in augmenting human capacity and at the workplace. Briefly summarize what the evidence is regarding their effectiveness and efficacy. And then finally, the second half of the talk, led by Carissa, will be talking about our research project, which is designed to understand how to effectively use this technology in construction. So just to give some background, which motivates our study is the problem of musculoskeletal disorders among construction workers, and it is a substantial problem, with these disorders being a little more than 10% higher than in all other industry sectors. Among all such problems, the back and the shoulder regions are the most frequently impacted, with back injuries accounting for almost half of all cases and the typical case involves over a, uh, eight days of lost work time. Shoulder injuries account for a smaller percentage, about 16% of all cases, but they tend to be more serious in terms of uh, lost time with a median of 25 working days. This slide just puts things in a little bit of perspective compared to other industry sectors. So the red arrow is pointing to a bubble that represents cons the construction and extraction sector. And this graph is showing the incident rate um, versus the time away from work. So there are some industries that are where these injuries are more frequent, but uh, construction remains an industry where the time away from work due to a non-fatal workplace injury remains quite serious. So quite a bit is known about the risk factors for both back and shoulder inju injuries. Um, just very briefly, the major risk factors that have been identified are an excessive load. So where the load on the body at some point in time, because of a certain task demand, exceeds the tolerance of a given tissue, whether it's a muscle, a ligament, or tendon, and the injury occurs. In other cases, it can be repetitive or sustained loads. 
where the load, a particular load is not excessive, but the tolerance of a tissue declines because of a prolonged or repetitive load placed on the body. And all three types of situations commonly occur in diverse um, construction tasks, and a few are illustrated at the bottom. Similar types of risk factors have been identified for shoulder injuries, such as non-neutral working postures, forceful exertions, and repeated or sustained reaches. And again, these commonly occur in different construction scenarios. So with that as a background, our focus in this work is on exoskeletons. Well, what is an exoskeleton? A definition here is given from the ASTM, so it's a wearable device, um, and it achieves several things. It either augments, enables, assists, or enhances an individual's physical activity, and it does so through some mechanical interaction with the body. And we've provided some illustrations here on the left of an exoskeleton designed to support the low back, and in the middle and the right are two different commercial exoskeletons that are intended to relieve loads on the shoulder. So lots of fundamental research out there about how they work, but very simply, without getting into the technical details, is these devices are, for the most part, designed to offload muscles in certain parts of the body. Uh, the most prominent and widely available devices are to support the trunk, or the, specifically the low back, and to support the arms, specifically the shoulders. And it does that by applying forces to parts of the body as the person moves around. So a back support exoskeleton typically will apply forces to the chest and the legs to offset loads occurring on the low back. An arm support device will typically apply forces to the, the upper arm, and in that case, to offload the demands on the shoulder. So conceptually, these devices are uh, intended to help affect the balance between task demands and, task and a worker's capacity or capability. Um, if the demands of the task are excessive and they exceed the worker's capability or the tolerance of different tissues in the body, it puts them at risk of injury. So these demands can be excessive either because they're of high repetition, of high force, or some combination of the two. Conceptually, an exoskeleton can enhance the situation by enhancing the worker's capacity for a given task demand. So a task that's un otherwise unsafe, imposing a high risk of injury, can become, if not safe, then at least safer. So out there in the marketplace, there are a number of commercially available exoskeletons, as well as a large number of devices that are being developed and tested around the world in different labs. So there's a, a website called Exoskeleton Report, which is one of the best uh, places to find information about what's out there. And you see here a listing of uh, what they characterize as industrial exoskeletons. And these are categorized by the different mechanisms of support. There's also an awful lot of research that's been done and is being done. This research is expanding very rapidly. And then the next couple of slides, I just want to give you some highlights of what's known already. So a lot of the initial work was done in a laboratory setting. Um, so some of the highlights, uh, some of the earliest devices that were released are listed here. One is called the Levo out of the Netherlands, and the other is Suit X uh, out of a company in California. So these are both back support exoskeletons. They have different mechanisms by which they work. And there's been a number of lab studies, a few of which are highlighted here, which show that these devices can reduce uh, muscular demands in the low back, can reduce discomfort experienced by a person, can increase their endurance time, reduce their energy expenditure. And this has been tested in both static and dynamic tasks that involve prolonged or repetitive uh, flexion or movement of the upper body. Also a number of lab studies that have looked at shoulder or arm support devices. Some of the earliest ones that were released were the Exobionics ExoVest and another SUDEX device designed to support the arms. And again, the lab studies are pretty consistent, as was the case for the back support devices. These shoulder or arm support devices do seem to be effective at reducing the demands on the musculature in the shoulder region.
In recent years, there's also emerging evidence from the field, so not in a lab setting, but actual testing in a workplace. Some of the earliest work was done on a device called the PLAID, or the Personal Lift Augmentation Device. Not a commercial device, but it was fairly well tested in a number of studies and seemed to be effective in the context of automotive assembly. The LEVO device, which I, on a previous slide is a back support device, was tested in the field and was found to decrease low back discomfort in automotive assembly. But there's also some evidence of what might be termed adverse effects, such as increased muscle activity in some muscles and participant reports of discomfort. So that's one point I want to raise that'll come up later is that there's, it's, there's potential for adverse or unexpected or unintended effects of exoskeletons that's really just emerging. The last device I'll mention is the Levitate airframe, which is pictured here. It's another arm support device, and that's been tested in a manufacturing environment as well as among surgeons, and in both cases was found to have some beneficial effects. So overall, with that background, um, we see three important points that should be mentioned. That, First, this, this exoskeleton technology is rapidly emerging and presents a clear opportunity to reduce physical demands and perhaps even enhance worker performance. It's a particular opportunity, we think, in the construction sector because in many ways it's a challenging sector with complex jobs, changing environments, changing job demands. And while these devices have clear potential, and they've mainly been tested in fairly controlled environments like manufacturing. So we see exoskeletons as, as having potential, as being an opportunity to worth exploring for application and construction. But there's also risks that are largely unknown, um, such as load transfer. What that means is we may be able to use this technology to effectively reduce demands at one body part, but the question remains whether it might increase risk and demands at other body parts. There's also safety concerns. So you're wearing a device, perhaps for long periods of time, that could impose its own risk. Um, and then finally, there are practical challenges involved in the use of exoskeletons in any industry, especially construction. First, that there's really no practical guidelines that have been developed yet. There's limited evidence overall and in, in the construction industry specifically. So with that as an introduction, I'll now turn it over to Carissa, who's going to talk specifically about our project. Thanks, Maury. So the primary objective of this five-year research project is to help facilitate the safe and effective adoption of passive exoskeletons in construction. We'll do this by first understanding the stakeholders' opinion on the possible applications of exoskeletons, as well as the promoters and barriers to their implementation. Next, we'll use laboratory studies to assess the effectiveness, efficacy, and safety of different exoskeletons for tasks specifically with high exposures while considering task variability and the unique demands in construction. Um, then we'll test what we learn in the field. And finally, we will uh, provide some evidence-based information on the effectiveness, efficacy, and safety of exoskeletons in construction as well as uh, providing some guidelines for how exoskeletons should be selected, adopted, and used. So our first aim is to obtain input from construction industry stakeholders. This aim is currently underway, and it includes collecting um, various input from uh, construction workers, supervisors, managers, or owners of construction companies of varying sizes from different trades and on both coasts of the country. We will ask about awareness of exoskeletons and opinions of exoskeleton use, including available technologies, usability, and any safety concerns. We'll ask about specific uh, ideas on promoters or barriers to exoskeleton adoption, We'll ask about opinions regarding various tasks or task characteristics, such as the precision required by a task or the complexity or dynamicity of the task, the posture of the task, uh, and the tool weight are all various characteristics that we'll be inquiring about. We want to know what kinds of 
characteristics of the task do people think might um, provide the most benefit from this exoskeleton? We'll also be looking at common measures for assessing productivity and work quality. So we want to know from stakeholders how they look at uh, pro both productivity and quality of work. And then we'll also be asking about information sources that are trusted for new construction technologies. So this model was published in a paper that uh, both Virginia Tech and UC collaborated on last year, and it outlines various topic areas that we'll be asking about in our survey and our focus groups. For example, to assess the expected benefits, we'll be looking at productivity gains, uh, reduction in musculoskeletal injuries or disorders, and ideas on how it might uh, provide better worker retention. As far as perceived barriers to exoskeleton use, we'll be um, asking about exoskeleton technologies, awareness, effectiveness, versatility, durability, and ruggedness concerns, uh, concerns about peer acceptance or opinion in their adoption, uh, as well as items on usability. Usability items uh, assessed will include things like the weight of the device, the ease of the use, how comfortable it is, how easy it is to put it on and off, um, how well it fits, and how compatible it might be with other personal protective equipment. We'll also be asking about safety. So how do people feel exoskeletons might influence catch and snag risks or fall risks, senses of uh, safety um, and uh, potential allergic reactions or hygiene issues. And then as far as exoskeleton technology adoption, we really are interested in um, what kind of training we think uh, people think will be required and accepted, trial ability, uh, and from a financial perspective, um, assessments on you know, return on investment or cost benefits that would be required for the actual implementation of the exoskeletons. So the outcomes for AIM-1 will explore responses to the various questions posed, and we'll also compare uh, responses by trade, by region, company size, uh, the type of exoskeleton, uh, meaning the shoulder versus the trunk exoskeleton, employers versus workers. We also want to look at responses by age and by experience level. Our second aim will determine the efficacy of commercially available exoskeletons. This project is focused on arm support exoskeletons and back support exoskeletons. Uh, the effects of the exoskeletons during simulations of targeted work tasks that vary load, precision, and posture uh, will determine the effects on work performance, physical demands, and usability. So some of the outcome measures that we'll look at in AIM-2 include usability and safety measures, such as how quickly it takes to put on and take off or don and doff the exoskeleton, and how much maneuverability people have in constricted spaces. We'll also be looking at posture control and balance using some different tests like the single leg jump landing test or figure eight walking test and have the, uh, the participants also climb stairs, ladders, and other activities that require um, balance. To assess the arm support exoskeletons, we've chosen three tasks that can vary posture, load, precision, and speed of work. So these are the task characteristics that we will explore. Uh, the tasks that we've chosen at this point include concrete grinding, tuck point grinding, and drywall hanging. We'll be varying posture by um, having some of those tasks require forward reach versus overhead reach. These uh, different tasks utilize different um, loads uh, handled in the hands or different tools, so you can see that they have light, medium, and heavy tools. Um, the precision and the speed of motion we feel is different across these tasks, and this will give us a good idea of how the different exoskeletons might uh, be effective given different task characteristics. For the back support exoskeletons, We've chosen floor tile installation and roof tile installation, 
again, these two different uh, construction tasks allow us to look at different characteristics of posture, load, precision, and movement speed. So these tasks will be done in kneeling and stooping on different inclinations. Um, we'll be using different loads as far as tiles and roof tiles and floor tiles. Um, and uh, we feel the, the, these two tasks have different um, precision and speed characteristics. For both the ASE and BSE, so the arm and back support exoskeletons, we'll compare tasks performed with and without the exoskeletons by measuring physical demands, such as um, oxygen consumption, which gives us a good idea of whole body effort, normalized muscle activity, so whether or not muscles are working uh, more or less given an exoskeleton, as well as 3D joint kinematics, which essentially gives us uh, the position and uh, velocity and acceleration of different joints. From a usability perspective, we'll be measuring skin temperature and user perception on comfort, both from contact pressure and um, or different pinch points, as well as temperature. And from a performance standpoint, we'll be looking at productivity and quality of work and perceived work performance uh, by the participant. So from these findings, we'll develop a draft of exoskeleton implementation guidelines for construction that consider various tax, task characteristics. We'll also consider the different exoskeleton types and other environmental and safety considerations. We'll bring these guidelines and the exoskeletons to the field to get a subjective assessment of its implementation. For example, we will want to know whether the guidelines are easy to understand and easy to implement. We also want to see if workers and supervisors can choose the appropriate task and exoskeletons to optimize the benefit and minimize any unintended safety consequences from the exoskeletons. The guidelines will be further revised based on stakeholder input from these field studies. Our final aim includes dissemination of the study findings nationwide. This will include dissemination to construction contractors, to trades, as well as health and safety professionals. So our next steps include looking for construction companies of all sizes with workers from different trades to respond to a 30 to 45 minute survey the survey uh, can be done by, uh, via interview with some of our researchers. It can also be emailed out and completed on any smartphone. We'll be uh, able to distribute a link. Um, people can click on that link. There'll be both English and Spanish versions of the survey. And um, we're looking to receive really a broad um, response from different trades, different age workers, uh, from different regions of the country, and different types of construction companies. Uh, we'll also be looking for construction companies or trade unions to facilitate a two-hour focus group where researchers can meet uh, with three to five workers at a time. We specifically want to look at roofing and flooring and concrete grinding, tuck point grinding, and drywall installation. Um, so if you are interested in participating at all, uh, either um, you're, perhaps you're part of a, a trade union or uh, a construction company, you can email us at these uh, emails on the left, and um, we'd be happy to um, include you on uh, either the survey and or setting up some focus groups. So with that, I want to um, thank everyone for joining us today. We're happy to answer some questions or talk about uh, some of the either uh, background on exoskeletons or the project that we proposed. Um, we also want to thank CPWR for their support of this project. Okay, thanks, Carison. Thanks, Lori. Um, we have been getting in some questions, but before I start going through them, I do want to say we have a couple of people with hands raised. Um, because of how the system works, we are only taking questions um, in the Q&A and chat boxes, so I can't unmute you. Um, I'm not sure if it was accidental, but if you're raising your hand to ask a question, please type it in, um, and then we will be happy to answer. 
Okay. Um, I think our first question is sort of a general question to everyone on the webinar, um, which is, can anyone share collective bargaining agreement language on um, the EXO suit? Um, so I don't know, Chris or Maury, if you have any comments on that, but just if anyone does have um, language that they're willing to share, if you send it to me, then I can get it to the person who made that request. Okay, I, I can also follow up with that. I, I know Ford worked hard on that type of language before doing some preliminary testing with exoskeletons in their assembly, auto assembly. So they'd be a good point of contact. There may be others. Great. <laughs> Next question is, uh, my concern is that these devices are just a new generation of black belts. Low transfer is certainly a concern, especially for long-term use. Are we just re-engineering the worker instead of the job? Carissa, you want to take that? <laughs> sure. Oh, well, we, we can both respond to it. Um, I, I don't think that uh, it, it's clear that there might be some issues with low transfer, but I think that overall what we've seen is that the um, you know, the exoskeletons have been beneficial for helping the areas of interest that are at higher risk. Um, I think there's, you know, still something that's something that we, we will be looking into, um, particularly uh, as far as unintended consequences go. If people are having more discomfort in, in other areas of the body, that's something that will be assessed. Maury, do you have any additional points? Yeah, sure. I just, I mean, that, that's a question that comes up, but Back belts work by a fundamentally different mechanism, um, just hard to explain in 30 seconds or less. But the transfer of loads that exoskeletons are intended to do is the effective ones seem to be done in a certain way that these adverse consequences are quite a bit smaller than the benefit. So there's, there's always a trade-off, but the benefits seem to outweigh any adverse effects so far that we know of, whereas back belts were designed more to stiffen a body structure, not necessarily move or reduce the load on a particular body part. It remains to have, clearly it remains to have long-term evidence of their effectiveness in real settings in terms of things like injury risk. Uh, there are groups starting to do that. It may be months or years till we have solid results about whether they actually help in reducing injury risk. Okay, so I think this next question sort of um, might be the same, same answer, but uh, getting at a similar concept, um, would daily use of an exo by a worker who is already weak or has muscle imbalances um, and pain further aggravate pre-existing medical issues by um, decreased muscle use um, or cause muscle atrophy depending on the exo used? Yeah, it's a very good question. The short answer is I don't think anybody knows. At least I've not seen any reported evidence about this. Most groups like us have started by testing these devices um, among otherwise healthy people. Uh, the logical next step is to look at things Questions such as, can an exoskeleton help someone that has a medical condition or an injury? Can it help with return to work? Can it help with rehabilitation in the workplace? I think at this point, those are largely unknown. The answers to those types of questions are largely unknown. Are there exos which are both arm support and back support? And if so, will you be evalu evaluating any combination exos? Excuse me. The answer, there, to my knowledge, there is one. So the company Sudex mm -hmm. makes a device, makes separate devices for the legs, the low back, and the arms, and those are, can be configured or used together at the same time. I don't believe anybody's tested those combinations yet. We are, in our work, we're focusing on tasks that have demands primarily at one body region, either mainly at the low back or mainly at the shoulders. In the future, there's certainly value in testing tasks that involve loads on multiple body parts, and that would certainly benefit by testing an exoskeleton that can support multiple body parts. But that's future work. Okay. Um, 
that leads into the next question. Are you, do you have a list of um, roofing, flooring, concrete grinding, tuck point grinding, and drywall installation as the tasks for your um, focus groups? Are you, is that all you're looking for, or um, what about glazers? At this point, we're open to considering other tasks. We identified the tasks that Carissa presented from our interactions with a number of construction companies uh, that led to the paper that she summarized, but we're very much open to considering other tasks for which an exoskeleton might be of benefit. So glazers is an interesting suggestion and one we can look into. Okay. Yeah, and we do hope to find, um, get more input from various stakeholders during the AIM-1, the survey and the focus groups on other tasks that um, maybe we should look into further. Sure. Okay. Um, and uh, also for volunteers of the study, are you focusing on um, companies in your region? Or I think you said that you wanted um, multiple regions, correct? We do. So areas. for AIM-1, yeah, so for AIM-1, um, you know, the, the in-person interviews will likely be in our regions, um, the east and west coast, but the survey can be uh, emailed out and distributed um, across the country. So uh, specifically for AIM-1, we'd love to broaden the scope of our reach. Um, for the laboratory studies, those will obviously be done, uh, you know, at our universities. Okay. A couple of questions about getting copies of the presentation. Um, I will yet be emailing um, the both a recording of today's event as well as a PDF of the slides. Um, next question: What are the price points for the EXO models discussed today? They range from about two thousand to five thousand dollars, and. My sense is that those prices will be coming down in the near future as um, as the market expands and the companies are able to reduce the unit costs. Are you considering use in elements such as rain and snow? At this point, yeah. no. You you are. Well, we, I, in the survey, we'll be we ask, will. Yeah, we'll be asking yeah. about that, but we won't be doing that type of testing. Um, would a full body exoskeleton be effective in eliminating load transfer altogether? Most likely, yes. Um, I think it's going to be a while till anybody figures out how to make one that's usable and cost effective. Uh, there are some exoskeletons out there that actually transfer loads down to the ground. One example is the Fortis by Lockheed Martin. Uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't gotten a, a widespread acceptance or use yet. That, that may change, and if so, it's something we might consider including in our testing in the future. Um, but as I briefly mentioned, most of the commercial devices out there are limited to supporting the back or the arms uh, by transferring loads to different body parts. Uh, I think in the future we're going to see more devices that transfer loads away from the body, such as to the ground, because uh, that would just eliminate or at least minimize load transfer to other body parts. But I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, our, pr our, our presentation and our work also hasn't considered what are called active exoskeletons that contain motors or other active devices. Um, those are really still in the prototype development stage, but they're coming um, probably in the next four or five years. There will be commercial devices available, if not sooner. But for now, we're focusing on these passive, they're kind of dumb devices that just respond to movement because that's what's out there. That's what somebody can buy to use in the workplace. Mm -hmm. All the photos appear to be men. Um, have all research subjects so far been male? Absolutely not. Uh, most of our studies have been balanced, equal numbers of males and females. Uh, we picked pictures mostly of folks in our lab, so we don't have to get permission. And I guess we just happened to get some of the male uh, student researchers in our pictures. 
Okay. Um, can you share your findings per task and exoskeleton? Can you repeat that? Uh, can you share your findings per task and exoskeleton? Uh, you mean in the future for AIM-2? Yeah. Uh, it, I'm maybe. not sure if it's in the future or for the lab research that's already. Yeah, well, do you that's want to clarify where you are and um, when you expect to, the timeline that you're expecting? For this project, um, and then also I'll just mention that um, so we're CPWR is at the start of our five-year grant cycle, and so um, many of our uh, re current research projects or all of our current research projects just began in September, um, and so uh, we wanted to start sharing some of them via webinar and get people familiar with what's going on. But I'll likely do follow-up webinars in the future. Um, uh, with many of our projects to share outputs and results. Um, but uh, yeah, do you just want to clarify uh, the timeline? Sure. So we're currently in year one on AIM-1. And so um, we're looking to uh, start distributing the survey uh, in March and um, then following up shortly thereafter with focus groups in May and June. Um, those both of the, the responses from both the focus groups and the survey will um, help to shape AIM-2. And um, my guess is that AIM-2 will be starting uh, in September, and uh, that will take us through another year, year and a half. Great, thanks. Uh, will you look at and evaluate the benefits of this technology on improving productivity for various jobs? Yes, that's one yeah. of our explicit goals uh, coming into this and based on our earlier survey is that productivity is a big issue and whether these, this technology will, adopt it, will be adopted. So we expect that exoskeletons will at least not affect productivity and in many cases could help enhance or improve productivity. And our lab studies are designed and will be designed to have measures of productivity, as well as our field studies in AIM-3 will be assessing that from a subjective standpoint. Can you comment on um, the possibility of exoskeletons leading to the perception that workers can do more work than is actually safe, similar to initial perceptions of back balance? Yeah, I'll give a couple of comments. Um, Two issues that I think are going to be important for the future. One is um, an individual's own risk perception. There could be the sense I put on an exoskeleton, I'm, I'm now Superman or Superwoman, and I go and I do something I otherwise know I should do differently or get help. So there's the potential for increased risk through just a misperception. The other, I guess, is more from maybe an administrative point of view that my opinion, I think Carissa has the same opinion, is that exoskeletons should not be used as a way to increase physical demands on a worker, but it should be thought of as a tool that can decrease the, the adverse consequences of a given task. If a task can't be redesigned or changed or otherwise modified, perhaps an exoskeleton can help reduce physical demands and injury risk. But my belief is that exoskeletons shouldn't be used as a way to make the demands or to increase the demands on an individual. I think ultimately that's going to defeat the, the purpose of an exoskeleton. Yeah, I would just add that part of what we're going to be looking at is how do we train both supervisors and workers um, to utilize the exoskeleton safely. And I think um, what Maury said is, is going to be an important piece of that. So making sure that it, they're not being used to increase task demand, but more to augment capacity of the worker so that, um, you know, there's better balance between the existing demand and their capacity. Okay. Um, have exoskeletons been tested while personal fall arrest systems are, are in use? Um, is there any interference if so? That's a question we'll be looking at. Um, when we look at safety and usability issues. Uh, I know it's a question that's come up 
earlier in discussions with others. There's at least one company, I shouldn't say which one because I'm not sure, but one exoskeleton company is working that, on that issue of um, integrating their exoskeleton with with a, fall or a wearable fall arrest system. I'm not aware of any technical reports or published research, however. Okay. Um, and uh, will you be looking at or is there existing um, research with workers in the concrete industry and the amount of dust that is created um, and how the different forms of dust affect the suit? I expect that so, to be an issue. Sorry, go ahead, Krista. Oh, no, I was just going to say, we, we will be able to look at that um, in, in our laboratory study where um, there will be some dust production and, um, we'll, you know, there, there are covers that are available for some of the exos. So I think um, that's something that we'll be able to look at. Jessica, I think you might have skipped a question. So there was one about ensuring test subjects have appropriate training and fitting. So do you mind if I jump in and answer that question? Yeah, I, I don't think I, I don't see that on mine. Oh, okay. Oh, well, so bo both of our groups have been, when we use exoskeletons, we get trained by the manufacturer and we follow their recommended procedures for uh, fitting an individual and teaching them how to use it. Um, I just see one more question on my list. Um, have any bigger companies started using exos already on a large scale um, in general industry? I think the most famous one is Toyota. So they've been using arm support exoskeletons for several years and in the past year or 18 months have implemented it on a, a large scale in, in their assembly work to the point where they're, for certain tasks and task demands, an arm support exoskeleton is actually required of a worker. And there's been some press about that. So if, if you do a Google search or other search on Toyota exoskeleton, you can probably find more information. And I think as a, they're, prob, they're probably the biggest user at this point. A number of other companies have been exploring on a smaller scale such as Ford, Boeing, John Deere, and a few others. I think the biggest users so far have been manufacturing, particularly automotive manufacturing. Okay. Um, I just got one more question. Will there be certificates of fitness required for use? Um, you mentioned manufacturer training similar to, uh, I think, power actuated tools, tools requirements for use of powder, ACU, tools, et cetera? Yeah, I think a ASTM, what is it, F48. So they're working on a standard for exoskeletons that covers everything from start to finish. And I suspect those types of issues might be answered in their standard. I don't know whether there will be any type of certification body, whether ASTM or uh, Who's the other group? I can't remember. There's another group where that's working on a standardized testing protocol. Great, thanks. Um, well, thank you for sticking around to answer all of those great questions. Um, oh, sorry, can you re repeat the name that you just said? Um, was it ASTM? ASTM, yes. And the standard is called F, as in Frank, 48. Okay, thank you. Um, if people have questions that come up um, that weren't answered during the webinar, you have um, Carissa and Maury's contact information. You also have my contact information, um, so you can follow up with any one of us. Um, as we uh, have findings collected, we'll also be updating the project page um, on cpwr.com, and as I said, we'll likely do future webinar a few years from now, um, but feel free to follow up with any of us if you're interested in volunteering or if you have questions. Um, and thank you both for the presentation and as I said, staying on for all these great questions. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you.